Oh, I have been forgetting to say at the beginning that we are on Circle Maker chapters 13 and 14 tonight. And the date is uh, June uh, 15th, right? Today was payday, June 15th. And um, for anybody that's trying to catch up with us and watching these Zooms, literally it just now got really humid in my house because it started raining outside like buckets. Give me a second. I'm going to check and see what it looks like really quick. Yeah. It's been supposed to rain all... It's supposed to rain all week, which as if we haven't already been flooding. But anyway. Um, so here's what I'm going to assume from the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We've got 10 of us on here now that some of us still haven't caught up yet and that's okay <laughs> that's why we're recording this and even if you're joining us tonight and you haven't caught up on the reading don't feel bad it's okay the last thing i want is for anybody to feel bad and oh my goodness before i start on circle maker let me say this i have spent the last several days recovering from convention slash things that went on at convention and other stuff and um just i don't know why everything like it made me so exhausted this time even more than like the people didn't exhaust me this time nearly as much as in other in, in other events that i've been to so it wasn't that i can't even blame it on that it was just everything and so i'm still kind of catching up um had some victories happen in the last week regarding some of that and we'll touch on that a little bit during this because i thought how prudent is it that these chapters are what we're reading there are several times that it made me think of what went on in the last week and yeah i'm gonna record it because it's all part of the history of this company so okay here we go the first little portion is i'm gonna go through this stuff relatively fast com compared to how i usually do stuff but the first portion of chapter 13 is talking about Conrad Hilton and I loved I loved his story I, I want you to notice something too for the future of your business I want you to notice that this entire book is built on storytelling no, there's hardly any factual information also something that um, a lot of you who have seen me train have seen, uh, have heard me talk about right brain and left brain, posting ads versus telling stories, all that kind of stuff. And today, uh, I was having a long, hard, like, look at some of the stuff I'm going to be training at in Tulsa this weekend. And I was like, Lord, I need a way to put that into really concise, easy to digest. Inf like, I want the information so simple that I can give them one example and they get it. And so, like, 30 minutes later, a lady calls me and she's telling me, can you remind me what that is, that story about your mom with the X factor? So I'm like, okay, I go into the whole story. I tell her the whole story. And as soon as I hung up, I was like, that's it. You can post an ad with the X factor and says it's this much more absorbable, absorbable. It does, has this much many more, whatever, all turbocharged vitamin. It has the, the current, it has the aloe, it has all these things your ad can say all these things. They don't remember the details of any of it. Like just now, here I am a diamond ambassador and I told you exactly how much I know about the X factor, but I can tell you my mom's story from front to back. And the majority of people who've ever heard that story can at least give you enough that whether they can convey the facts to you or not, they can convey passion because they're like, you need to hear the story that this girl told me. Because once I heard the story, I realized, oh my gosh. So why did I start telling that? I was really, really praying today. I want this, um, Dilly, quit laughing. I was really praying today that, um, that this Tulsa training would be very powerful for a lot of people, that I would be able to um, really convey to people strong messages, and I've really been watching a lot of Brene Brown, B-R-E-N-E Brown. Her stuff on vulnerability and fear and shame has been so powerful for me regarding what's been going on with me in this last week. And I don't know, I wasn't intending on talking about any of that tonight, 
Um, but as I started talking, I felt started feeling the Holy Spirit telling me I needed to share that with you guys. Um, you can Google her. You can watch her on YouTube. She has tons and tons of stuff. Her very first thing that she ever spoke on was vulnerability. Um, and it was a TED.com talk. And if, if you've never watched that, just watch that and it will force you to watch the rest of her videos. So, okay. The Conrad Hilton story, incredible story. I loved how he, um, I can't remember. I didn't circle it here, but basically it says something about the queen. He had called her the queen and it was all because of the king. Oh, that's what made the queen possible at the top of page 151. The queen was all always subject to the king. And then he starts talking about Daniel on page 151. That second or third paragraph down in that portion says, I'm sure Daniel prayed with a greater degree of intensity right before he was thrown into the lion's den. But that intensity was the byproduct of consistency. He approached every situation, every opportunity, every challenge, and every person prayerfully. And it was this prayerful posture that led to one of the most unlikely rises in power to power in political history. How does a prisoner of war become prime minister of the country that took him captive in the first place? Only, only God. <clears throat> the ascendance of Daniel defies political science, but it defines the power of prayer circles. Prayer invites God into the equation, and when that happens, all bets are off. It doesn't matter whether it's the locker room, the boardroom, or the classroom. It doesn't matter whether you practice law or medicine and music. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. If you stop, drop, and pray, then you never know where you'll go or what you'll do or who you'll meet. <clears throat> and then it starts talking about prayer postures. And this is something that um, the people in my Southern Baptist church are very uncomfortable with. Different ways of worshiping the Lord. I can remember my aunts telling me that the first time that she saw my pastor, my pastor who comes from a very charismatic background, but he's landed somehow in a Southern Baptist church, which I'll never understand, which is awesome though, because I love it. But she said, I remember the first time I saw him raising his hands, I wanted to go up there and grab his hands and put them down by his side and tell him, that's so disrespectful. And I was like, how? Okay, because I didn't grow up in church. But, oh my gosh, I can feel that notion to actually raise my hands. And I actually, since I was never taught what it meant, what it supposedly meant, and it's just a feeling that I get, in my heart it means like surrender, like worship. Like I have no power, I surrender. And I don't know for sure if that's what it's supposed to mean, but when I raise my hands, that's what I mean. I fully worship. And I think to myself, as she says that in front of me one day a few years ago, I thought, how can you think that that's dis how can you think that's disrespectful? It's like the definition of respect. It's the definition of you are the all powerful one. You are the one. And it's a misconception. So when it starts talking about prayer postures here, I was like, this is really cool. I love the part page 152 where he starts talking about uh they begin, let's see. On the fourth chapter down, he says we begin with our hands facing down symbolizing the things we need to let go of. It involves a process of confessing our sins, rebuking our fears, and relinquishing control. Then we turn our hands over so they are facing up in a posture of receptivity. We actually receive what God wants to give, joy unspeakable, peace that transcends, under, transcends understanding, and unmerited grace. We receive the fruits and gifts of his spirit with open hands and open hearts. I loved that. I also love the fact that while it very much made me um, upset at my parents once I grew up and felt stupid about biblical practices, uh, when I was in college and I was taken to things where people obviously knew that there was more than one Mary in the Bible, and when they're telling a story about Mary Magdalene, and I thought they were talking about Jesus' mother, and I had no idea, so I was mad at my mother, I think, why wouldn't you take us to church? It also sort of makes me sit in a stance of, I get it, that everybody's life is on purpose and intentional and whatever childhood nonsense you had, the way you grew up or the way your mom did take you to church or didn't take you to church, it's all on purpose. And 
I'm actually glad that I didn't because I see what happened to my aunt. Does that, does that make sense to anybody? Like, I see that my aunt thought that raising your hands in um, worship was disrespectful. And I thought, well, where did she learn that? She learned that from religion. If y'all, you guys may not really understand what I'm, I'm, how I'm trying to make a difference between spirituality and like religion as in the law, like what, what uh, people interpret to be the way things are supposed to be. I feel like people use religion to judge other people um, as a measuring stick, stick to judge other people and be like, well, I'm a little bit more religious than you are because look, I, I, I can use this ruler, which is the law, and I can measure myself up against you. So in that way, sort of glad that since I know that the church I would have been raised in is the same church that my aunt would have likely been, you know, raised in. I'm kind of like, well, okay, at least at the age of 20 something, I was learning things from scratch. Like, and fortunately I was in a, in a spiritual situation to where I was very open to learning. Uh, the majority of the stuff that I learned in my twenties was very basic information. Hang on, I'm going to mute everybody again. I'm starting to hear some feedback. Anyway, okay, I said I wasn't going to make this long, and I'm rambling. So, okay, let's go on to page 155. Thank you. That third paragraph up that starts with after. Let me see what we're talking about here. Oh, spiritual priming. After taking the five-minute test, students were asked to walk down the hall and talk to the person running the experiment about their next assignment. An actor was strategically engaged in conversation with the experimenter when the students would arrive. The goal was to see how long it would take students to interrupt. Um, Barg uh, wanted to know if the subjects who were primed with polite words would take longer to interrupt the conversation than those primed with rude words. He, he suspected that the subconscious priming would have a slight effect, but the effect was profound in quantitative terms. The group primed with rude words interrupted <coughs> on average after five minutes, but 82% of those primed with polite words never interrupted at all. Who knows how long they would have patiently and politely waited if the researchers hadn't given the test a 10 minute time limit. Our minds are subconsciously primed by everything that is happening all the time. It's a testament to the fact that our minds are fearfully and wonderfully made. It also testifies to the fact that we had better be good stewards of the things we allow into our visual and auditory cortices. Cortices, I guess. Everything we see and hear is priming, priming us in a positive or negative way. And that's one reason I believe in starting the day in God's word. It doesn't just prime our minds. It also primes our hearts. It doesn't just prime us spiritually. It also primes us emotionally and relationally. Relationally. When we read the words that the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit inspired, it tunes us to his voice and primes us for his promptings. Then skip down to the very last uh, paragraph before the larks and owls portion it says prayer is priming prayer puts us in a spiritual frame of mind prayer helps us to see and seize the god-ordained opportunities that are all around us all the time this is a great answer to the question that may be going on your mind that is like well if god knows everything that ever was going to happen and ever did happen and ever will happen then what's the purpose in praying for anything which has been something that has gone in my, gone on in my mind and probably goes on in the minds of lots of logical people all the time. If prayer is priming and puts us in a spiritual frame of mind later, it says it's almost as though prayer gives us a sixth sense. And then at the top of the next page in the morning, Lord, you hear my voice in the morning. I lay my request before you and I wait expectantly. I love that. So good. Um, in his words, I would, I would rather, let's see who we're talking about here. Hang on a second. Uh, this came out of a biography of D.L. Moody. Um, it says, in his own words, I would rather be able to pray like David than to preach with the eloquence of Gabriel. And then at the very bottom of 157, it says, our biggest shortcoming is low expectations. And I have that like quadruple underlined. 
we underestimate how good and how great God is by 15.5 billion light years. One way I've put this principle into practice is praying through my calendar instead of just looking through it. And I thought, okay, how cool would it be? Because how much time do we spend just doing like this? We're like, oh, oh, that's interesting. Oh, that person's eating. Oh, that person's at the gym. This person checked in here. Oh, that's interesting. This person is bragging on their kid. Oh, you know, whatever. If as we did this, because people, sometimes they're going to tell you their concern and sometimes they're not going to tell you their concern, but literally if every post that we actually stopped and read, like, you know, scrolling through here, I'm not going to stop and read that one. That one looks stupid. I'm not, I mean, this, I'm just giving you the reality of what people do. Oh, I saw that one earlier today. That's another Plexus post, another Plexus post that, that one looks stupid. Oh, and you stop. Okay. This one, I'm going to read this one. And as you read it, you literally pray in your mind. You stop and say, Lord, whatever this person's concern is today, whether their, their post is about a concern or not, I just lift that up to you. And I thought, oh my gosh, praying through my calendar. Well, I don't keep a real rigid calendar. I don't keep the greatest organization of anything, which I, Missy, she's on here. <laughs> I see. I was like, I saw her a minute ago. Where'd she go? Missy can attest to the fact that half the time I can't find my calendar, but I can always find, if I need somebody to pray for, there's a bunch of fools on here I can pray for. All day long, every day, I look through these people, and even, let me tell you something, as we scroll past these Plexus people posts, Plexus people's posts, <laughs> as we're scrolling past them, even if we don't know these people, when you see it, like, you see an awesome testimony, let me tell you something about those people. Just because they have an awesome plexus testimony, I can promise you does not mean that they're not having probably daily spiritual struggles or daily worldly struggles or struggles of all kinds. Um, this was a really good reminder to me. I thought, how often do I look at their situation, look at what they posted, maybe even make judgment on what they posted or what they had to say, and when I should be really actually uh, lifting that person up in prayer. Honestly, even if we don't know them, I feel like that that's what we're called to do. So, okay, praying through your calendar or praying through your news feed, whatever, you know. Praying, if you're a calendar person, ding, 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 Melissa. If you're a calendar person, you should probably look at your, like, every single day that you have, you know, lit up with things to do. That's probably what you should be like. Okay, Monday's full of, you know, schedule and pray over that schedule. I think that would be really... I mean, a cool way to look at doing things. Cause honestly, I've never thought about that. I'd never thought about using your calendar as a tool for prayer, but it makes sense because your calendar, if you're a calendar person, your calendar spells out literally the ABCs of everything that's about to go on in your week and other people's weeks. Hang on. Erin says she has to go because of something. Oh, <laughs> okay. Talk to you later, Erin. <laughs> Okay, so the next page, 159. It says, uh, my grandfather suffered from a medical condition that caused his hands to tremble. And his writing was virtually indiscernible. Um, and then the next paragraph says, seeing the verses that my grandfather underlined is powerful and meaningful because it helps me get into his mind and in his spirit. I hope that the promises I have circled in my Bible will help my grandchildren do the same thing. I have to tell you all really quick what this made me think of. My grandmother who passed away when I was in first grade, this is my dad's mother, um, was a very devout praying woman. I barely remember her, but I, re I feel like I do because so many of the uh, grandkids really keep her alive in, in my, our minds or whatever. But my dad was uh, seven when his, my dad was seven when his dad passed away. So he was primarily raised by his mother and she couldn't drive. Uh, she had no formal education. Um, he got, my dad was run over by a semi when he was 12 years old and he was, he was riding his bicycle down the street or down the sidewalk. And he crossed the street at the same time that a semi was turning and it literally ran over him and crushed his bicycle. And he had, he had a really big like keloid scar all my life down his stomach from where they did some sort of primitive, I'm sure, surgery back then. 
and uh, the money that he got from some sort of settlement from that company bought them their first house that didn't have a dirt floor. And so my dad grew up on a dirt floor until he was 12 and which my mom has always said, she's like, that was different, different. He grew up in the same generation as her, but he seemingly grew up like my mom's mother, if that makes sense. Like he grew up like a different generation and why I started talking about this. Oh yes. My grandmother was a praying woman and I literally, sometimes God will literally give me this notion, even though I did not know that woman that like when a prayer will come alive, uh, uh, an answered prayer will come alive in my life or in my children's life. I feel like it's literally because of her, something that she prayed in her life, probably prayed continuously. Um, I'm not, I wasn't one of the chosen grandkids that received like one of her family Bibles or anything like that. And she had all these cool diaries where she wrote all kinds of, she was one of those that you just, she wrote her whole life out and on paper. And some of the grandkids got some of that stuff and it's full of stuff that just makes you cry. And I, it's something that I think, Oh man, I hope I can live up to, you know, something like that for generations after me. Um, he starts talking about, I'm sure Honey the Circle Maker prayed in a lot of different ways at a lot of different times. He had a wide variety of prayer postures, but when he needed to pray through, he drew a circle and dropped to his knees. His inspiration for the prayer circle was Habakkuk, which um, that Habakkuk is my, my favorite scripture, which Aaron bought me the bracelet that said Habakkuk. And um, Jennifer, my first cross had the first the cross thing you bought me had Habakkuk on it, didn't it too? That's what I thought. Uh, it says, I will stand upon my watch and station me within a circle. What do you dream big? What do you pray hard? And what helps you think long? Okay, let's turn to the next page, 160. Wow, I have this whole page. Let me see what I'm reading here. Okay. Yeah. It's faith. It's not a methodology. It's theology. It doesn't matter whether it's a circle, an oval or a trapezoid drawing prayer circles is nothing more than laying out our requests, laying out our requests before God and waiting expectantly. If walking in circles helps you pray with more consistency and, and intensity, then make yourself dizzy. If not, then find something, find anything that helps you pray through. Then I have the entire next portion. I have a little like bracket over it. Oh, I was going to say that that next portion makes me think I'm in a prayer group on Facebook with some ladies and they're talking about in what they're talking about here on page 160 reminds me a lot of the, the group that I'm in. And I, I would, I would encourage those of you who are not, I'm not talking about on Facebook. I'm talking about in church or, um, with your neighbor or your friend or whatever, if you don't have a group, um, a group of women is a great way to do it as women to be in a prayer group with other women is a great way to do it. But literally being in a prayer group like that, it's amazing how God will show himself to you in groups like that. Because, you know, when we pray for ourselves and we pray for other people, sometimes we don't get to see the, the praise reports. We don't, you know, sometimes their, their praise will come true or their, their praise will come to fruition and we don't ever know about it. And it's really cool when you're in the prayer group like that. Okay. Page 161. This portion right here, when I read this book the first time, set me free of a lot of guilt where it talks about the game with minutes because I'm one of these people that since I would say maybe since after a year or so after my brother died, my life was, was and is completely different in regards to a relationship with God. Prior to that, I made all my decisions on my own. Uh, didn't really consult with anybody and didn't care to consult with anybody. And I didn't prayerfully consider anything. And I went through a season of not prayerfully considering, but 
prayerfully surviving what seemed like a really dark, dark, awful time. And then after that, it really changed the dynamic of how I do everything. And I always would say to God, because I pray, because I feel like I don't pray the way my uncle Gene prays at Thanksgiving dinner. And by the way, I can quote it. I know exactly word for word what it is. And any other time we eat a meal and he's there and it always sounds like he's giving, giving it at a 4-H banquet. It's always the same words. Bless the hands that prepared it and bless those that are traveling and, you know, and I never, I'm not making fun of that. I'm just saying I didn't live up to that standard. And besides, mine was more in snippets all day long. It was like, as I would encounter something, it would be like, I don't know, God, what do you think about that? I mean, that's how general and like vague, I, you know, I'd go get in my car, be headed somewhere, get a phone call. It wouldn't be a phone call. I would like the, the tone of, I'd hang up and I'd think, gosh, I don't know, God, what do you think about that? Or um, get home and people would be in my house would be in a bad mood or whatever. And I'd be like, I'd go to my room and be like, gosh, Lord, what's going on in my house? And throughout the day, it was just like a, it's not like I pray all day, but in the back of my mind, it's a constant consideration of the fact, and it's a constant realization that, and anybody who's ever gone through major grief knows this. It's the constant realization of, I don't really have any control over anything, like anything. And anything that I think that I have control over is the definition of illusion because I really don't. And so all day long, that's where my brain is. And so I walk around in, at first I walked around in fear and that's not where I'm supposed to be. And then I started when I started just communicating on a regular basis, basis with the stupid, what I looked at as stupid, I don't know, God, what do you think about that type of communication? It's, I, I believe now, especially after I read this portion here, that the realization is the beginning of the realization that we don't have any control over anything. And then to constantly lean on him in, in like, I don't know. I don't even know why somebody would ask me that, you know, like, I don't know why anybody would rely on me for an answer to that. That's going to be totally up to you. You're going to have to give me for the answer for that. And to me, that is prayer. Like whether I sit down and I solemnly say it or whether I bow my head when I say it or whether I put my hands like this when I say it, or even if I close my eyes because I don't like when I pray for some reason, it's not, I, kind of like, you know, I know that's probably disrespectful, but for some reason, when I close my eyes, especially if other people are praying, like my brain immediately like sucks out of my head, like out of my ear and it floats around and like, it needs to be like focused. So literally, literally, if I look at my own thumbnails, I can concentrate or focus or whatever. <laughs> so I thought it was interesting that the, it talks about prayer posturing and then it talks about basically having a life like sort of like I just described that I sort of felt guilty for that because my all day long was a constant realization of the fact that I have no power and constantly communicating with God about that. Like, uh, I don't really have any power anyway, Lord, but I do communicate with you about this. I do, um, rely on you for the answers. I rely on you for everything. Um, the very bottom very last part of 162 says, what if we stopped reading the news and started praying it? What if lunch meetings turned into prayer meetings? What if we converted every problem, every opportunity into prayer? Maybe we'd come a lot closer to our goal, praying without ceasing. Uh, the part of the Brene Brown stuff that I've been watching, she talks about how all news is, if you're, one, if you're a person that likes to get up and watch the news, the news is its intention is to teach you what to be afraid of and who's responsible for it. So if you wake up and you're like, I need to turn the news on so I can know what to be afraid of and who's responsible for it. And if that's not how you look at it, then you're probably delusional about it. Because if we live in, if we 
And I'm not being rude about that. If y'all disagree with me about it, y'all are just wrong. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if you disagree with me about, I totally agreed with her about that. When I thought about it, I was like, okay, is that, that's not how I looked at the news. Cause you're looking at the news, like, well, it's a responsible thing to do to educate yourself on what's going on around the world. But the truth is it's all filtered through someone else's opinion first before it ever hits the airwaves. It's all filtered through someone's slant on what they're, what, whatever something that they hope to gain from it. You know, like whether it's that person talking about it or it's the network, whatever, someone is hoping to gain something from the way they report a news story. And I'm going to tell you, here at my house, we've cut a lot of TV watching out. Like there's still some of it that goes on, but the more we do that, the more I feel like, uh, well, I feel like a little bit of a psycho crazy homeschool mom that doesn't let her kids watch TV very much. But I also feel like, wow, it's like you had, it had me chained, uh, not just to a time schedule, not just to a, a certain amount of hours a day that I gave to the television, but it had me chained to people's burdens that were filtered through someone else's opinion. It had me chained to all kinds of things. Facebook will do the same thing to you, by the way. I mean, there's a lot of news on Facebook, but okay. Chapter 14. I should hurry up. Okay. Pa uh, go to page 164. Uh, that's at the very, before it starts the sonic boom portion. It says that is when you need to press in and pray through. If you allow them to your disappointments, will create drag. This is where they're talking about breaking the sound barrier, I think. Yeah. If you allow them to, your doubts will nosedive your dreams. But if you pray through, God will come through and you'll experience a supernatural breakthrough. And then I wrote in ink, like Karaginen. And be, because I reread all this, like I read this the first time, these, this book, I've read it more than like, I guess this is probably my third time to read it completely through, but I didn't even really underline or highlight this portion the first time I read it, but this coming on the tail end of what happened with uh, our most recent product release. And some of you do, and some of you don't, I know some of you joined us last week on this particular call. This is an intimate group setting. Um, I want you guys to know that uh, first, before I go into all this, that I love our company like crazy love our company. But this, this, what recently happened at convention was yet one more thing that was so abundantly clear to me. Once I got home, I mean, I'm gonna tell you what, nothing was abundantly clear to me except for I was ready to choke somebody the first several days. Like Missy can tell you, I was off my rocker about this whole thing. But now that the, everything hit, the dust has settled. It was one more instance because I don't know how many times at my training I have said, these products, they're so amazing. It's like God literally put his hand down through the crap clouds and dropped them into the hands of the people at, at corporate because literally the people at corporate, eat, they have no idea. You can have dinner with one of them once and before you walk away from there going, they have no, like they're so out of touch with the testimonies that are going on. Like they did not create the phenomenon that Plexus is. They themselves. Uh, and it's not a coincidence. It's not a, how did that, I mean, to me it's, yeah, how could that possibly happen? That we have products that address gut health, that address weight loss, but blood sugar, hormone imbalances, um, mood disorders, uh, PCOS, and all these other things that our products help. And now we're going to have this amazing product. By the way, I saw a testimony on this, pro this new product, someone who's like biting the capsule and swallowing the oil. After two days, after two days, she's like, oh my gosh, I only got one bottle. Did anybody get another bottle? She said it helps her clarity so much, uh, clarity and mental focus in like, she's been literally using this two or three days now. I'm trying to think what else, else she said. Mental clarity, focus, creativity. Uh, she was, her question was, because she didn't post this on her wall, she asked this question to her upline ambassador. Can I take more than two a day? Because when it wears off, it goes away. And I really wish that I had that back again, the mental clarity that comes with two capsules of the new product. So 
we have this amazing product, but also again, the divine revelation in my mind that these products and the men who bring them to us have nothing. The men who bring these products to us have nothing to do with the divine appointment for these products. Does that make sense to you guys? Like it's not of man. If it was, <laughs> if they had the sense that God gave a goose, there would not have been, now they have great business sense. They are, and they are men of integrity, but they don't have the product sense. They don't even know. They don't even know what's going on out in the field. So anyway, okay. So I got really like to thinking about this. If you pray through, uh, when it first happened, the first thing I did was start blowing up one of their phones, like boom, text message. And there was no response. And so it feels like 20 minutes have passed when it's probably only five. So I text him back again. And then like 30 minutes later, and we are in between sessions. We've just left the session where somebody told me as I was walking out the door, oh my gosh, guess what? I was like, what? And they told me. And then like fog covered me from head to toe. It was like, oh my God. Oh my God. I can't think straight. Went to lunch. Couldn't think straight. People were coming up to me asking about it. And I'm like, don't just get away from me. I mean, I'm so distressed about this. And then I'm blowing up the phone of one of the guys at corporate and nobody's answering me. And then I started to sort of calm down about it a little bit during the next session, but I felt like the calm was the calm before the storm. And it was because all these people after that next session, it kind of went viral and everybody's letting me know there's carrageen in the new product capsule, blah, blah, blah. Then Sunday we have a diamond meeting and we find out that they don't, that they love us. They don't, they're not going to do anything that hurts us and that they use the safe kind. And I'm like, no, I mean, this is not going to work. <laughs> anyway, Monday comes, Tuesday comes, Wednesday comes. And finally they let us know on Thursday that they had had enough of a response from people. But I had to hear some news on Monday that, basically kind of like devastated me and made me realize that Lori, you don't have any control over this delusional Lori. If you think that you have any control over this and you're in denial because you have no control over this, the news I heard on Monday, which was basically that all my efforts were in vain, all my efforts of telling everybody, Oh my God, we got to do something. Like I'm blowing up the jewels page. I'm blowing up the diamond page. I'm blowing up the email of anybody who will listen and I'm blowing up the text messages of anybody that I think is pertinent that will listen to me. And that was all weekend long. Then Monday I hear the news that they're still kind of like, I don't know. We don't really get, we don't see the problem with it. And it was like, okay, you need to think, you need to think about this, not in a logical way, but in a spiritual way. This is clearly a battle because I don't want them to catch the relevance of it the hard way. Does that make sense? Like if this is a lesson to be learned, I don't want it to be a company wide lesson. I want this to be, well, obviously I have no control over what it is to be, but anyway, when they announced that they finally decided that they would take it out, let me tell you, I can testify far and wide. That was, on, that was God and only God. Because I can tell you, I wasn't swaying them. That's what I found out on Monday. They were not swayed by Lori Harrison and it didn't really matter what she thought about Kerrigan. And so, okay. Page 165. Now I'm really sweating y'all. <laughs> okay. When you get to the point where you care more about what God thinks and less about what people think, you're getting close to the breakthrough. Turn to page 166. We're talking about Daniel here in the very last paragraph. He says, I can't help but ask a counterfactual question. What if Daniel had quit praying through on day 20? The answer is simple. Daniel would have forfeited the miracle the day before the day. I don't know where you are on the timeline between praying through and breaking through. Maybe you're at day one. Maybe you're at day 20. Either way, you can pray with a holy confidence knowing that with each prayer circle, you are one prayer closer and don't give up. Like Daniel, the answer is on the way. Um, second paragraph under empty, empty stomach second sentence. It says it takes the combination of prayer and fasting to unlock some double dead bolts. I will confess to you that this is something I've never done. I've never fasted. This last thing, had I been thinking clearly, would have been something I would have fasted over. 
Um, it doesn't just break down the challenges I'm facing. It also breaks down the calluses in my heart, which ultimately is what prayer is about. It really has less to do with the outcome. It has really nothing to do with the outcome. It has, has to do with how the journey changes you and it, how it changes your faith and what you rely, faith and what you rely on. Page 168. Every breakthrough has a genesis and a revelation, literally and figuratively. There is a first breakthrough and a second breakthrough. The moment you began praying, a command was given. And then at the top of the 169, the great danger when God does a miracle is that we get comfortable. That's when we've got to stay humble and stay hungry. If we aren't careful, we can lose faith simply because we already have what we need. Uh, 170. Down at the bottom of one set, I have a couple other things on here outlined, but I've already gone like 45 minutes. So, um, the good news is that you're only one defining decision away from a totally different life. If you obey God in the little things, then God knows that he can, he can use you to do the big things. Oh my gosh. Do I ever think of that often. I'm going to tell you something when that announcement was made or when that, not the announcement, when I started receiving text messages at convention, I just thought I can't even, I couldn't even believe that it was going on. I couldn't believe the, I could do a two hour talk on what went on in my brain when that was announced to convention. But anyway, I wonder if Daniel ever had one of those out of the spirit moments when he looked in the mirror and asked himself, how did I get here? Daniel's destiny traces all the way back to one resolu resolution not to defile himself, but making the resolution was easier than keeping it. That's where prayer coupled with fasting comes into play. Have you guys ever fasted? Raise your hand if you ever have. You have? Dilly has. I can't see somebody because your her hands are as Katina, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. See, this is something I'm going to try for sure. Okay. Uh, not try it as an experiment. Obviously it's biblical. So I know it's true. 172. Um, Brian is winning the battle because Christ already won the war. Oh, this is talking about um, the man who had the pornography addiction. He is now praying circles around the men that God is bringing into his circle of influence. And if you listen to the, the accuser of the brethren, you'll feel like a failure. Too many men have believed his lies. The truth is that the victory has already been won. Top of 173. To seal the victory, all it takes is a defining decision and a daily decision. Defining decision and a daily decision. This moment doesn't mean it will be easy. In fact, the longer you've been in bondage, the harder it will be. Some of us don't start the start fighting the battle because we're not sure we can win the war. But the war has already been won nearly 2,000 years ago at Calvary. All you have to worry about is winning the battle today, and God can take care of tomorrow. That's one of the things my pastor says all the time is he's always telling us, don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. That's why that song that you used to hear on that commercial, One Day at a Time, Sweet Jesus, which that commercial used to annoy me as a kid, but do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow. I come from a long line of women who borrow trouble from tomorrow and next year. So that's definitely fighting against my flesh, not to talk to borrow, borrow trouble. Um, I think worrying about things in, in my, the line of women that I grew up, my grandmother, my mom, my aunt, all the women who had heavy influence on my life when I was growing up, um, worrying was looked at as the responsible way to live. If you weren't worrying, clearly you weren't doing your job because worrying is what we do. Okay, 173. This part where he talks about um, Jesus uh, in Gethsemane, praying hard and thinking long, and he's asked the men, couldn't you keep watch with me for one hour? That kind of, like, I, I didn't even remember that part from the story. I didn't realize. Because I wonder if Peter, Peter would have denied Jesus, Jesus if he'd been praying instead of sleeping. The next page, 174, it says, The problem isn't desire. The problem is power. More specifically, willpower. 
This is where fasting comes into play. Fasting gives you more power to pray because it's an exercise in willpower. The physical discipline gives you the spiritual discipline to pray through. An empty stomach leads to a full spirit. The tandem of prayer and fasting will give you the power and willpower to pray through until you experience a breakthrough. Okay, and so now I'm fixing to read like two small paragraphs to you. And we're about at the end of this. At bottom, page 174 starts with, Prayer. Prayer is the way we escape the gravitational pull of the flesh and enter God's orbit. It's the way we escape our atmosphere and enter his space. It's the way we overcome our human limitations and enter the extra dimensional realm where all things are possible. Without prayer, there is no escape. With prayer and fasting, there is no doubt. Like tandem staging, it will take you to spiritual heights you never imagined possible. You won't just escape our atmosphere. If you pray a little harder and fast a little longer, you may just shoot the moon. This is talking about um, Neil Armstrong and uh, Buzz Aldrin. Um, then I love this part at the end. It says the first thing that they did when they landed on the moon was celebrate communion. Because of a lawsuit filed by Madeline Murray O'Hare when NASA aired the reading from Genesis by the astronauts of Apollo 8, it decided to black out that part of the broadcast. Aldrin, an elder in the Presbyterian Church, took out a communion kit provided by Webster Pres Presbyterian Church in Houston, Texas. In the one-sixth gravity, the wine curled and gracefully came up the side of the cup. Just before eating the bread and drinking the cup, Aldrin read from the Gospel of John, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him he bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. It must be hard not to dream big when you're 238,857 miles from Earth. It must be hard not to pray hard when you're traveling 25,000 miles per hour through space. It must be hard not to think long and think different when you're watching the Earth rise from the surface of the moon. After the greatest technological feat the world had ever known, Aldrin circled back to an agricultural metaphor about bearing fruit. It's a long way from the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane to the Sea of Tranquility, both in terms of miles and in terms of years, but when you plant carob trees, you never know when or where or how they will bear fruit, but bear fruit they will. 2,000 years later and 238,857 miles away, they will bear fruit from here to eternity, from here to infinity. So, okay, this week we need to finish, like, it's not any more, I don't think it's any more actual, too many more actual pages than what we read this week, this past week, um, because the, the majority of the end of it is a lot of notes, at least in my, my copy of it is, copy of it it is. So, chapter 15 to the end, until you get to the notes portion, so... Um, sorry, I took so long. I don't know why I always do that. And Missy, I think we were supposed to have Beverly on here tonight, weren't we? I forgot. Totally forgot. I did too. And I looked to see if she was in there and she wasn't. Yeah. So maybe we can get her. She didn't message me or anything today that I saw. How about I put that on my calendar? That's a good idea. Maybe I'll even highlight it. Highlight it. And start. Okay. Well, that'd be perfect because we're on our last chapter next week. Maybe she can join us for a few minutes. She may have forgotten too. So, um, yeah, I haven't heard from her at all. Today. I haven't either. So, okay. So tonight, since we're, we've got one chapter or one week left, um, I'm still recording, right? Okay. Does, does anybody want to pray over us tonight? I can't. Let's see. It looks like we've got 14 of us on. Anybody want to pray? Okay. I'll pray over us. Uh, oh, did somebody raise their hand though? I did see a motion. No, I think it was Jennifer Cole's dog. <laughs> What's that dog's name, Jennifer? She's going to have to unmute herself. Gracie. 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 Uh -huh. Gracie. Did you see that Jetty um, shaved all our dogs down to the skin almost? <laughs> like mountains of hair, but at least it's not mountains of hair that's going to be in my house. 
So, okay. Cut all his hair back and y'all cut it all off again. Yes. That poor dog. <laughs> he left the tips of their tails so they look like they have a lion tail. They all, I mean, they've got these fluffy tails and then it goes down to skinny as a pencil. It's, I mean, the tip of their tails is fluffy. It's funny looking. Anyway, okay, well, um, I will pray over us and then we'll stop the recording and then I've already taken up too much of y'all's time tonight, but I appreciate you guys joining us. And we have our um, other call on Wednesday nights at, this one's, it, it, the other one's at 8.30, isn't it? On, on Wednesday nights, 8.30 Central. Okay. Father God, I just want to, um, well, Lord, I just feel, I feel compelled to, to say that I know that you would like us to lay all our burdens at your feet. Whatever might be trouble in our hearts, Lord, I think that that's probably at the forefront of your mind. I feel it on my heart tonight. Whatever may be making our hearts feel um, sad or troubled, anything that we feel that we might have it in our own power or we feel like we don't know how it'll ever be taken care of, Lord, to you, I'm just excited and grateful that the future isn't a mystery to you. You already see it and you already know it and that we should rest peacefully knowing that and that you intend everything for our good. Lord, if there's anything going on within in this group tonight that has people feeling fearful or has people feeling any kind of worry or any kind of doubt, if they're doubting their faith, Lord, I just lift that up to you. I just ask that you just do something in their lives. Do anything, Lord. Do something that's so characteristically you that you can't be, not, be denied. Lord, I lift up our families to you, our kids, and uh, Anybody that feels like they're under attack, I don't know why it keeps coming back to this, but I feel like if anybody thinks that they're under attack, Lord, that they just, they know that they can't solve the problem within their, within their own means, Lord, that there's only one way. And that is to literally let go of it. And that's, why is that so hard for us? I do not understand that. But I'm grateful. I'm grateful that the burden doesn't all rest on us. I'm grateful that the burden is yours. So grateful for these people that are on my team. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt how special they all are. And I know how called they are, how unique they are in your kingdom, Lord. That each one of them is precious in your sight. And I'm so grateful for that, too. I lift up, I know that we've got a lot of women on the call tonight. I lift up our marriages that you would just pour out an extra special blessing and anointing, maybe a realization to us of as women, how we're called to pray over our husbands. The realization that they're just little boys in big bodies. And that they probably are fearful. They don't know the answers and we rely on them a lot when we really shouldn't. And Lord, just give us a daily reminder of that. Some daily reminder, even when they make us mad or they do something that's stupid or selfish or something that we would, that would be our reminder to pray and that we pray through long and hard until we see breakthrough in that Lord. I pray over kids represented anybody who's watching this call. If they're watching it live or watching it later, pray over the kids represented. I pray that we are raising kids Lord that are above the influence 
any bad influence and that they are divinely influenced only by your Holy Spirit. That you would literally send angels to watch and protect these kids, like flocks of angels, to be there to guard these kids, to guard their spirits, because I just know this next generation is going to be so powerful. And I know that that's why we're called to keep them so protected and we're called to pray over them. And so give us daily reminders of that too, Lord, to pray over these kids, to love them wholeheartedly, even when they goof up, to show them a version of you, Lord, by extending grace to them first instead of disappointment. And lastly, I want to lift up anybody that we come into contact with through our businesses. It's weird to think of the word client or customer or team or even ambassador. Really, those words seem really strange to me because this business has brought me such really, such great relationships with really great women that I call friends. And I just pray that you bring us more friends, people who are maybe not qualified, maybe not even people who have any idea who you are and that's okay. And I pray that we won't be afraid of that. Like as you bring I just feel like you're going to bring us all this different culture and this different everything. And I think you're building us on a strong foundation right now, Lord, this really strong foundation to where we all can join hands and link hands together right now and be really strong for each other. So as you bring people into our lives that have cultures and beliefs that scare us, that we're not scared, but instead we just shine for you. Like we don't have to attack them. We don't have to be anything blatant we can just be who we are in you and that just an example of who you are will be cur- make them curious and nosy maybe because they can see peace they can see grace and i just ask you literally lord bring us those by the truckloads who cares if they can sell product or not bring us a flock of those and i just pray that these strong women that i'm united with tonight And if there are going to be men, I know there are going to be men listening to this call, but these strong women that you've called for such a time as this, that their purpose is that you would give them just for laughter's sake, that you would give them a little glimmer, a little glimpse of what their future holds, something prophetic that would make them super excited to wake up every morning, super excited that they're when their feet hit the ground, that they know that they have a mission that is so distinctly and divinely called by you that it makes them excited to live life every single day. Makes it easier to get over the little struggles because they know that they're called. I know that they're called, but I want you, Lord, I'm asking you to show them, to show them that they are called for the kingdom. I pray that I'm not leaving anything out. If there's any, any other prayer requests out there, Lord, I just lift those up to you. Anything that someone's afraid to say, I lift those things up to you, Lord. And I ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. Okay. My dog's barking. Okay. Okay. I've unmuted you. I've unmuted you so. Oh no, that's bad. Oh no, that's bad. <laughs> okay. Everybody's muted. If anybody has anything they want to say though, you'll have to unmute yourself. <laughs> and if nobody has anything they need to say, y'all need to get out there and do what you're called to do. <laughs> I don't know who this is on a 918 number. Does anybody know who that is? No. 918-331. If I talk about them long enough, they'll eventually unmute themselves. (laughs) 
忘了。<笑>